All right, great, thank you. Um, so breaking tradition here with all the UW talks we've had so far. Um, I'm the, I think the only person today talking from Children's and we are showing you the map here. We're just down the road um, at the Seattle Children's Research Institute. We've got a great building here at 9th and Stewart and um, we end up collaborating a fair amount with people at the Hutch and Children's and um, I've actually got some funding through the UW. So even though we're all from different places, we're a nice little happy family. So what I want to talk to you today a little bit about is um, gene editing the hemoglobin locus. So we've heard a little bit about gene therapy. I want to go a little more in depth. Um, Gene editing is, has been really coming to the forefront of scientific endeavors in the last decade. Um, and in 2015, it was listed as the science breakthrough of the year. Um, in particular, they focused on CRISPR. Um, but other endonuclease technologies and editing tools have been um, in the forefront of the gene editing movement here over the last decade or so. And for good reason. Um, in the past, our targeted, um, our ability to target was very limited. When we wanted to do gene therapy, we were introducing large uh, chunks of uh, genomic material or synthetic constructs into the cell, usually with viruses, uh, with some unintended consequences when we had non-specificity of where these um, sequences integrated. Today, we have a whole variety of tools that focus on being able to target specific sequences. So one of the first that was used are our zinc finger technologies where little trinucleotide repeats are used for specificity and then a nuclease attached to that can make a specific double-stranded break. Um, Talon is a second um, um, tool that I'll be talking about a little bit more here where we have individual nucleotides that are recognized by protein motifs and that specificity again gives you a double-stranded break at a very targeted spot within the genome. Other tools that are now uh, really popular are the CRISPR-Cas9 technology, where the Cas9 protein is coupled with a guide RNA. And again, we make breaks where we want them. And there's also hybrid tools that are used uh, at Children's and other places, um, referred to as megatals, where we have a talon motif as well as a homing endonuclease. All of these centralizing on the idea that we can pick a specific target. Once we make that double-stranded break, there's two ways that we resolve that. So the cell has to be able to repair double-stranded breaks um, endogenously. One of them is the non-homologous end joining, where it just takes the two ends and sticks them back together. But it does that with a little bit of, of flexibility, where nucleotides are either introduced or deleted, or indel generation occurs. The other is homologous um, directed repair, where we take a donor template, whether that's the other chromosome or in, um, since a sequence that we've introduced into the cell, and then as the repair occurs, it will insert whatever intervening sequence is provided. So for our situation, we wanted to say, what is a target that makes sense for uh, the world in general and for medicine? And so we went after um, hemoglobinopathies. So 5% of the world's population carry a gene for a hemoglobin disorder. And the largest uh, population are in the sickle cell disease and beta thalassemia population. So this is a good target that's going to be applicable to a lot of people. Um, we also know that disorders of beta globin th synthesis are the most important prevalent or most prevalent genetic mutations in humans. So fairly low hanging fruit if we're going after a genomic target. Um, the other nice thing is that it has a high potential for being able to be amenable to gene therapy. These are cells that can be removed from the body. Um, hematopoietic stem cells have been used for bone marrow transplants for decades. Um, and we know that we can take those cells out, do some manipulations to them, and be able to put them back into the patient. So we also are able to realize that autologous transplantation, where you use the patient's own cells and return them to themselves, is much more tolerated than allogeneic transplants, where you're giving them someone else's cells. So if we're able to take those cells and successfully gene edit them, we are potentially able to offer a therapeutic benefit to that patient. A little bit overly complex for this um, group, but the general idea here is that hemoglobin, um, the hemoglobin locus in humans and in many animals is a sequence of copied um, genes. So you have the beta globin locus in particular has several globins that are expressed throughout different stages of development, embryonic, fetal, and ultimately adult. And in that case, um, when we have disorders of the adult globin, um, expression here in either sickle cell or thalassemia, some patients um, have the fortunate uh, additional phenotype of continuing to express some of the embryonic and fetal globin so that they're able to have a normal globin that functions as in the adult um, patient but, uh, and helps alleviate the symptoms that they would otherwise have from having a deficient beta globin. So, 
the, the control of this is far more complicated than we can get into here, and we don't fully understand all of the control of this region, but we do know that, this, uh, that the controller mechanisms move from one to the other and eventually express the adult globin. So if we can make adjustments to express the other fully functioning globins, we don't have to introduce new sequence necessarily. We can just use what's already in the cell and promote expression of fetal hemoglobin. Um, so when we zoom in then on this locus, we have each of the different hemoglobin molecules. We then targeted a gamma globin locus where we can look at the promoter control elements here. And from within that element, we wanted to look at the sequence level and say, what are the known uh, mutations that can lead to an increase in fetal hemoglobin? And in this case, we, all of the stars here represent known SNPs. And then there is a region of 13 base pairs that's fairly unique to increasing in fetal hemoglobin mutations, where as opposed to being a single point mutation or a large deletion of material, you have 13 base pair deletion that, in, that is increasing to a large degree the amount of fetal hemoglobin seen in a population of patients. And we think we understand this because this region is very critical to the binding of some repressive elements, but also to some promoter elements. And when you remove this, this repressor element area, you're left with just promotion. So you're able to see the increase in gamma, field, or gamma globin expression. So what we did was we said, let's design something that targets this precise site and makes that double-stranded break. So we have a talon that binds to one side and a talon that binds to the other. And that brings together the two halves of the endonuclease that I'm showing as scissors here. The scissors make our double-stranded break, double stranded break. And then we rely on the cell's own endogenous repair system to make those insertions and deletions and disrupt the binding of this repressive element, um, which is shown here. So if we have the indels generated in this area, this whole repressor complex can no longer bind. We still have promotion. And so we would hope to see what we see in patients, which is an increase in fetal hemoglobin. Um, so to do this, we take 34 cells from donors. So the donors have provided us with their hematopoietic stem cells. We put them into a condition where we can put the mRNA for the talons into those cells with electric um, nucleofection. And once the electroporation happens, the cell makes the protein for us. So the protein is generated from that mRNA. Eventually, both the mRNA and the protein go away. And the protein finds the genomic spot that we've identified, makes the double-stranded breaks, and then all of our machinery is gone. All that's left is the, are the edits that we've intended. And on the right here is an example of one way that we look for these edits, where this is the specific um, amplification of PCR of our targeted locus in both the gamma-1 and the gamma-2 hemoglobin. And then below here is the, is the endpoint where we've created insertions and deletions, and we can see a little ghosting of that on PCR. And I can explain that more later if someone's interested. Uh, when we look at the sequencing, so we take individual um, genomes from the cells that we've edited, and we sequence through that region to see if we have made any edits. And in the control cells, of course, we don't have any genomic edits. Um, nicely as expected, when we look in the globin locus, where we're targeting, we see an array of different insertions and deletions. Again, what we're expecting, because the cell doesn't have a specific template to repair with, it's going to make these insertions and deletions somewhat at random. But nicely, these fall right within the region that we are anticipating, both from our cuts, but also from the nature of this locus. And we get about a third of the cells experiencing an event. From that, we also want to say we've edited these cells, we've altered them. Can they still function? Can they still go on to make the cells that we anticipate? And so with this, these are some cells that we have put through differentiation media, and we can see a nice little red hue. Um, some of the same cells we can plunk into a colony forming assay where the cells will, will sit in a semi-solid media and form clusters of the cell types we're looking for. And in this case, these are little red cell clusters. So we see that not only are they functioning as red cells, but they're functioning in the same way that we anticipate in a colony forming assay. Um, next, we want to say, well, did we change the amount of fetal hemoglobin? Uh, this is a little bit challenging to assess, but one of the ways we do that is just with flow cytometry. We're able to fix the cells and put in an um, um, antibody to fetal hemoglobin and see if we've made an adjustment. 
And so while there's always some fetal hemoglobin in our culture conditions, we can see that in the unedited cells, we're at about 60% in some of these cases. And after talon editing, we can bump that up to 85%, which again, remember, this is not a, a specific targeting. There's a whole mixture of cells, some that are edited, some that are not. So to see that whole population jump by a third is really exciting to us. Um, we're also trying CRISPRs at the same target site, and we're not seeing quite the same degree of increase, but this target is also an area that's of interest. Um, so a quick summary of that general concept. Um, so we're able to target that 13 base pair deletion with both talons and CRISPRs, and really you could do this with any other targeted endonuclease system. Those are the two we focused on. Um, we're making targeted breaks and generating the indels that we've anticipated, and some of those indels look just like what we see in the patient population. Um, the edited cells are being differentiated in vitro into erythroid cells, and that the erythroid cells are expressing higher amounts of fetal hemoglobin. So it's doing all of the things we hoped that it would do. Um, remember that I said there were two ways to repair. So this was just allowing nature to take its course and creating variable indels. The other is to give it a repair template. So we've been generating a large list of, of repair templates and um, more than we've been able to test so far, but we're in the process of going through all of those. And they can contain various elements. So we have homology arms on either side of that cut, and then we fill it with whatever we want to fill it with. We can move those components around. Um, we've actually put an entire uh, globin molecule into this region. Um, there's enhancer elements, selection elements, and then that repair will occur at the site that we've created the double-stranded break if all goes well. Um, an example of a very simple repair element is just containing uh, the, the homology arms and then a promoter driving a green fluorescent protein. So this is not an antibody showing us the cells. This is the cell making fluorescent protein if it's there. And when we look here at cells that have been edited with the talons and with a virus containing our template, we're able to see that in the virus alone cells, the background GFP is essentially gone by this culture day. Um, however, if we look at the talon and virus edited, we see about 25 to 26% of the cells that are expressing GFP. So not only have we created those cleavage events, but a lot of those were repaired with our sequence. And then showing you those same colonies, um, these were actually colonies that were edited with that virus. And excitingly, when we looked under the microscope, they were glowing green. So the cells are making the protein that we stuck into that site. So pretty exciting that we could go through that whole process. Um, so what do we do with that? So now we are trying to further minimize the effect of all the things we're doing to these cells. The electroporation to get in the talons, the virus introduction of the um, repair template that we're putting in, and other effects on the cells so that we can minimize the, the impact on these stem cells, which can be fairly um, finicky to work with. We're trying to iterate um, our HR template design to improve our rates and functions so we get the components we want and express the way we want to express them. And we're working on xenograft models. So we currently have the edited cells um, in a mouse model. And we just, uh, a couple of days ago, got some evidence that there is some engraftment going on. And so we'll be really interested to see if those cells not only are functioning as stem cells, but are continuing to um, survive and compete against the non-edited stem cells in that mouse population. So that's an ongoing experiment right now. Um, we are also working with a group at the Fred Hutch um, looking at the potential of editing primate cells and then putting those back into a primate system. So whereas we're trying to put um, human cells into a mouse, and there may be some fighting between the two lines there, if we can take primate cells and put them back into a primate, that's one step closer to our ultimate goal, which is to get to clinical trials where we're able to alter the expression of the globins um, on a fairly minute level within a patient population of either sickle cell or beta thalassemia. The nice hope there is that since this is a sort of one um, fix fits all, we wouldn't have necessarily a repair mechanism for simply sickle cell or all of the different mutations for thalassemia. We would have one correction that could potentially be used across the entire hemoglobinopathy spectrum for beta thalassemia and sickle cell. Um, the last thing, the concept that we're focusing on is figuring out which cells we're actually editing because we know there are some cells in the population that are long-term repopulating cells and some that are already committed progenitors and we're trying to tease out the concept of which cells are more amenable to editing and what we really want is to get the small number of long-term cells to be edited and happily engrafted in uh, mice, monkeys, and ultimately in people. 
happy to take questions. And oh, we've got some uh, thank yous, of course. We have lots of thank yous at the, uh, at the Children's Institute. Um, our, our little team focusing on globe and editing and the Scherenberg Lab, um, Andy Scherenberg, is uh, myself, Samia Batabi, Julia Yang, who are here in the audience today, um, Kyle Jacoby, Brian Gordon, and Garrett Hefner from Bluebird Bio. Um, we've got a lot, of other, a lot of other contributors in the Scherenberg Lab, our viral core, um, as well as some people at the Fred Hutch, and um, now starting to engage with people at the UW more. Thank you. Any question? Hello. Thank you for that talk. Um, the the part where you just you talked about the variable indels yes. and how the cell just repairs that uh, portion of the DNA, mm -hmm. um, and it might be different for different like cells. Right. How um, it, does that does that process have any other side effects from just having random parts of, of DNA missing? Yeah. So it, it it certainly depends on the frequency and the size of the indels that generated. So um, from other reports of do, of doing this type of indel based editing. Um, it depends on the locus a bit. So, and sometimes you'll have a high frequency of very small inserts and deletions with a lower frequency of large chunks of DNA that are removed. Um, we have the potential in this site for larger chunks because there are two versions of the gamma globin uh, where cuts should be happening at both of those. And there's a chance that the cell will just drop out the entire intervening sequence and pair those together. Um, thankfully, because they're so similar to each other, we'd expect for that to uh, result in the expression of whatever gamma globin was left. Um, the nice thing, too, is that since we're not just relying on the indel generation uh, and we're doing homologous repair, whatever that process is will ultimately be a lower percentage of the total cells we're editing. Um, but we do have to think about the safety down the line of if we generate an indel that could somehow be pathologic, what could that be and how do we watch for that down the line? Um, at this point, I don't think we have a lot of expectation that we would create um, dangerous or deleterious indels at this particular site. Um, but in other sites, if you were looking at tumor repressor elements or other areas, that would be a very big concern. Yes, sir. Hi. A quick question. Can you comment in your system about the frequency of homozygous versus heterozygous mutations at a given cut site? Yeah, so not right now. We don't, we don't know for sure. The frequency is a little bit hard to tease out in this system. Um, we do um, have a sense that there are times where you will have homozygous edits in those sites. Um, but we don't have a good sense of our, of our efficiency, of our rates of getting homozygous versus heterozygous. In the, then in, in the homology directed repair application, you were saying that you were thinking you would just need one homology template for a wide swath of opathies. Is that right? Right. So, so it, and the reason I, not, I had to gloss over that fairly quickly. The reason being that we're not targeting the mutations in the beta globin locus. We're targeting the site upstream of the gamma globin. So whatever um, that sequence will exist in, in both your beta thalassemia and your sickle cell patient. And whatever we drive in that region, the hope is that that's preferentially expressed to any pathologic regulate the fetal as opposed to correct the right so so the cells the cells that are edited there and then have insertions and deletions will upregulate fetal which is good the cells that get the repair template especially if we put in a globin of our own design that will then be the preferentially expressed globin in that cell so either case whether we get um, homologous repair or insertions and deletions we can expect a benefit to the patient okay Thank you very much. <laughs>